This program is a Warren Stiebel production in association with South Carolina ETV. Funding for Firing Line is made possible by a major grant from the John M. Olin Foundation, Incorporated, and the Friends of Firing Line. <laughs> Senator Joe McCarthy is back in the news, the result of the publication of the Venona Decrypts and the uh, corollary books and articles and rants and raves of a kind that were the daily fare during the years 1950 through 1954, <coughs> when Senator McCarthy was prominently in the news. For reasons perhaps understandable, the focus of today's hour will be on my own treatment of the phenomenon in the novel just published, The, the Red Hunter. Our guests include Hilton Kramer, he is the editor and publisher of the New Criterion, a monthly review of the arts. This is a graduate of Syracuse who did graduate work in Columbia, Harvard, IU, and the New School, and has served on the faculties of Bennington, University of Colorado, and Yale. He was chief art critic of the New York Times for a decade before resigning to serve as editor of the New Criterion. This is a keen and informed critic of communists and fellow travelers. Uh, Victor Navasky is the public face of The Nation magazine, the oldest left opinion journal in America, which he has served as publisher and editor. He is a graduate of Swarthmore at the Yale Law School, served as an editor of the New York Times, and wrote Kennedy Justice, a book on the record of Robert Kennedy as Attorney General, and another book naming names on the House Committee on American Activities and the Hollywood Witnesses there. The Red Hunter is a novel and seeks to tell a story, the story of Joe McCarthy. Those of you who have not read it should know that the author concludes <coughs> that McCarthy did more damage than good to the anti-communist cause, but that this was so in part because of his own extravagances, but in part also because of the awful extravagances of his critics, which are with us yet. <coughs> Since I'm the host of the program, but also the author of the book being discussed, I welcome initiatives taken by our guests I begin by asking uh, Ms. Kramer, did McCarthy bring on a reign of terror in the art world? Uh, the short answer to that question is no. I don't think McCarthy had any effect whatever on the art world. Um, he had some effect on the entertainment industry, uh, but that was largely because the entertainment industry had um, been so uh, susceptible to communist penetration and had indeed, uh, in its heyday, in both Hollywood and in the Broadway theater, uh, practiced its own version of blacklisting by blacklisting anti-communist uh, actors, writers, uh, performers. Um, I think I may have been the first person to write about this uh, in an article in the New York Times uh, in 1976 called The uh, Blacklist in the Cold War. And uh, at the time, it was an article that brought the largest uh, response that any article in the Sunday art section of the Times had ever brought. A rather amazing response. In some How do you respects. account for that? Well, it, uh, it touched a nerve because nobody had been willing to speak up about the other blacklist, as I called it. And uh, some amazing uh, figures responded to that article. Uh, Arthur Schlesinger, for example, uh, he would rue uh, the memory now. I wrote to the Times saying that uh, this article should be mandatory reading for everyone under the age of 40. Did you read it, Victor? <laughs> yes, I did. In fact, he mentioned, he mentioned my book in it before I had even finished writing my book and publishing it, told me what I was going to say. But, and I was right, uh, too. <laughs> but I think that, <laughs> uh, I think you were half right uh, about what I was going to say, but I don't think there was any uh, blacklist by the communists of anti-communists. There were communists who did not hire uh, other writers because they didn't like their politics. That's true without question in Hollywood. It's true in publishing and it's true everywhere just as uh, some people don't hire other people because they don't like them. But there was not the systematic industry-wide uh, purging of people for their uh, anti-communist views in Hollywood, on Broadway, or anywhere else. How did McCarthy, if at all, bear on the 
point you're just discussing. Well, the McCarthyism. Yeah, I mean, McCarthyism uh, describes a period in American history that started before McCarthy came on the scene, and and its legacy is with us, I would argue, to this day. It lasted long after he left. But he was the most visible um, proponent, exponent, and exemplar of a phenomenon which uh, I would characterize as uh, punishing people for their political uh, beliefs, activities, and associations. How do you punish people for their beliefs? Um, keep them not, from... Not vote for them? Uh, well, that would be, uh, I would think, a, a democratic way of punishing them. Keeping them from practicing their calling or their jobs. Punishment. You still call it punishment? Well, sure. There's nothing wrong with, with uh, that kind of punishment, I would say. But keeping them from uh, practicing their calling or their jobs, I would say, there is something wrong with. Um, stigmatizing well, them embarrassing their families, uh, making it impossible for them to live in a community because of the role he played in the larger political culture. That was a form, <coughs> uh, and driving people from the country, depriving them of the right to travel by keeping uh, passports from them, depriving them of the you right to be it? buried in uh, uh, the Arlington Cemetery because even though they had served in the military and might otherwise have been eligible, they were found to have communist pasts, depriving them well, of, let me, let me, let me, of their right to counsel. Slow down a little bit, will you? Sure. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah, ask. If, uh, uh, okay, you, you, you find out that your neighbor is a member of the Ku Klux Klan. Yeah. So you say to um, your wife, um, I'm not going to invite them over anymore. Is that punishment? Uh, it's deserved punishment. I didn't ask you about deserved. I said it's punishment. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, it's well, a form of punishment. Suppose you found yeah. out they were communists. Would it be deserved yeah. punishment? Yeah. From your perspective, uh, sure. No, from well, yours. I'm, I'm, from well, mine, no. Because well, from, from it wouldn't uh, bother me if they were communists. It would bother me that they were a member of the Klan. That's uh, could, could you I'd dig us out of that problem, Dr. Kramer? <laughs> well, I'd like to... Um, I mean, I the, the notion that uh, uh, expressions of taste can be construed as punishments I find morally ridiculous. Um, but among the many things that Victor mentioned, uh, with the withholding of passports, for example, yes. in that period, I myself only knew one first-hand example, and that was the case oh, of Rockwell Kent. Uh, well, uh, artist who Rockwell, Rockwell Kent. Kent. Yeah. Well, uh, we can get to Rockwell yeah. Kent because I happen to have been the only foreign journalist uh, in uh, uh, in the ga press gallery at the Kremlin on on the day in June 1967 when Rockwell Kent was uh, received the Lenin Peace Prize and um, and uh, but he got had, to travel by had an interpreter uh, uh, give me a, a, a detailed uh, running account of his speech in the Kremlin in which he denounced the United States as a genocidal uh, nation and so on uh, but uh, no it was my it was my old uh, friend uh, Josephine Herbst whose uh, executor I am uh, who was deprived of a passport uh, during that period, and I have to say deservedly so, because she uh, labored for, uh, in the interest of the Communist Party, uh, to which, uh, which she was never a member, but her ex-husband John Herman had been, uh, uh, particularly at the time of the Hiss case, when she was in a position to know that Chambers was telling the truth, because her husband, John Herman, ha was the man who introduced Hiss to Chambers. Uh, and uh, she denied all that. Uh, uh, on she, the oath? Uh, well, uh, to the FBI, yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, she lied <coughs> to protect the, the uh, uh, communist interests. And when that was discovered, she was uh, uh, declared by the FBI to uh, be somebody who had to... Uh, uh, Stay on the reservation, not be allowed to go abroad. Right, yeah. yeah. Uh, I didn't think that was cruel and unusual punishment. Um, and I remember when, uh, when Hiss came out of jail, uh, Whitaker Chambers writing to me <coughs> that he, was, uh, he, he deplored the temporary uh, injunction against giving him a passport. But <coughs> he said that on straight civil rights uh, grounds, which is a little bit different from your, from your Herb story, isn't it? Yes, it is. And by the way, uh, as far as I know, Chambers never mentioned Josephine Herbst. Uh, to uh, any of his uh, uh, interrogators. He did mention John Herman because he was under the impression that Herbst had never actually carried out any espionage work herself. Well, uh, do, do you have any quarrel with the treatment 
<coughs> of, um, of McCarthy in this book, in respect of the points that we've touched on, did he accelerate, did he attempt to increase the quote unquote punishment of uh, communists and, and fellow travelers as you, re as you think about it? Oh, I think he did, uh, particularly toward the end of, uh, you know, at the climax of his career, uh, what brought about his downfall. Uh, I think he did uh, turn on the heat uh, in an excessive way, yes. Uh, I find, frankly, the, the treatment of that in the book uh, quite fair and accurate. But I think one of the things that is missing from our discussion so far is that uh, the whole McCarthy phenomenon, both McCarthy himself and what came to be called McCarthyism, it simply cannot be comprehended in isolation from the almost total denial, that stone wall of denial that the, that the political left and the liberals put up in regard to uh, figures like his. Uh, it was that total abject <laughs> denial conducted for a long time in the pages of The Nation magazine, among others, uh, that made an industry out of denying Hiss's guilt, denying, now let me finish, Victor, sure, sure. Uh, denying that there, that, the, that there was any, uh, any real uh, uh, secret uh, espionage network uh, in the government. And it was the intensity <clears throat> and density of that denial that prepared, that gave uh, uh, Joe McCarthy uh, his platform. You don't like that, do you, Victor? And, and, well, and then, of course, coming at, <coughs> the, coming at the moment, coming at the moment when the, commun uh, the communists marched uh, uh, into, uh, to South Korea to conquer uh, South Korea, I mean, uh, that exploded. Uh, that gave, if it hadn't been Joe McCarthy, it would have been somebody else. Okay. First, uh, let me say that I am one of those who believes that the case has yet to be proven against Alger Hiss. I know that puts me in your view as a member of the Flat Earth Society, but nevertheless, My view too, yeah. but nevertheless <laughs> I believe it and I'm happy to talk to you about it if you'd like to. Uh, to say that The Nation uh, was one of those magazines that argued about it, yes, you were writing for The Nation during those years, Hilton. You were writing very interesting art criticism during those years where you pointed out that art had political content, which you now, I don't know if you still hold to that view, oh, but some anyway, does, sure, some some doesn't. Good. So, uh, uh, absolutely, The Nation, uh, ran a series of articles by Fred Cook and by others in which it questioned both the procedures uh, and the evidence with regard to the Hiss case, and, I, and I've written some of them. I'd be happy to talk to you about it. On the other hand, uh, it's wrong to say that the nation or the left denied that there was any espionage in, by Russians in the American government any more than uh, I would suspect that we uh, had espionage over there. That's what goes on between great powers. Uh, it goes on between the United States and Israel. It goes on, <coughs> unfortunately, between friends as well as neighbors. I want to come back for a second to the uh, point you made about right to travel. One of the peculiarities of our uh, policy during those years was we kept people like Rockwell Kent, who eventually won his passport as a result of Leonard Boudin's representation in the courts, and artists and writers and others in this country from traveling, and yet we deported people like this uh, Chinese nuclear physicist who it turns out, if you read New York Review of Books, a great article by Lars Eric Nelson, it's also an Owen Schrecker's book, turns out was one of the leading um, nuclear physicists in the world. So we sent China this information free of charge way back during the McCarthy years because we wouldn't let it work here. Are you saying something more than that people can be yeah. stupid? Uh, Bill, I think I'm saying that stupidity is equally distributed between Democrats and Republicans and <laughs> communists and non-communists. And that, yeah, that, uh, that, that, and that your book, one of the interesting things about your book to me is you were very uh, careful to paint, paint McCarthy warts, warts and all mm -hmm. on the one hand. On the other hand, there were a lot of stupidities on the right uh, and as part of that operation that you left out. For example, the acceptance of someone like Harvey Matuso, who said there were 125 communists in the Sunday Department of the New York Times, when at, at a time when there were only 93 people who worked there. I left that. Yeah, and, and, and certainly not more than 80 of them were uh, yeah. old leftists. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, <coughs> you know, my book does not attempt to chronicle all the stupidity during four years. That would be impossible. Mm -hmm. Yes. But <coughs> it does say that McCarthy made absolutely unsubstantiated, unsubstantiated statements that he got more and more reckless. Yes. 
and that for this he was correctly run out of town, town with wet towels, but that what is unremarked is the lengths to which his critics went. Now, yeah, here we are dealing with a critic of McCarthy who doesn't think that Alger Hiss was guilty, which is a, you know, therefore two plus two don't equal four problem, which, which makes any, any kind of progress difficult in this particular field. And I think Mr. Kramer is correct uh, that uh, <clears throat> when one month before McCarthy gave his speech, Alger Hiss was convicted, and uh, his, his conviction on that occasion seemed to cast doubt on, on the whole uh, in liberal intelligentsia who'd backed him, and uh, it created a kind of feverish uh, reaction which he ignited. Is that, is that correct? Yes. Well, I mean, Chambers put the matter correctly when he said it was the best people who were defending Alger Hiss, mm -hmm. meaning the most highly educated, the people who wielded power and influence, uh, people in the media, people in the universities, uh, people in the entertainment industry, uh, 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 people around the Democratic Party. People uh, who knew him. Uh, people who knew him. Absolutely. Yeah, people yeah. who knew him. Yes. Like Chambers. Uh, yeah. And, and uh, it was, as Chambers said, the best people who defended him. And it was basically the, uh, uh, the lower classes in America, if I may use that un-American term, uh, who believed Chambers and, and therefore believed, uh, became followers of Joe McCarthy. And uh, the, the, without that stone wall of liberal left denial, uh, McCarthy's success, um, you could even say incendiary success, uh, is simply incomprehensible. I mean, the one mm -hmm. immediately prepared the ground for the other. One of the interesting things about that period to me is that Chambers, as a matter of record, lied before the grand jury, lied under oath before the Congress, changed his story. At first he said Hiss was not involved in espionage then. That well, he was, was trying to protect At first Hiss. he said, well, he says that, but whatever it was, he was under oath, he, he lied. Secondly, he, he changed his story. He, Sixteen times he changed the story. Hiss never, Hiss asked for the, uh, 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 the opportunity to sue Chambers. He went to court, not Chambers. He didn't change his story until the day he died 50 years later. Yes, so well, that's, he, that's, he, a, that's he, just a fact. He, it's, well, it's for the, better well or worse. his, his was but, uh, under Communist Party discipline, of course, and Chambers was no longer. <laughs> well, yeah, well, let's, let's, let's yes. leave Hiss alone, okay, because <laughs> yeah. uh, as, yeah. as you point out, that's another story. <clears throat> but uh, I have a question for you about sure. your book, Bill, if I may. Sure. Y your lead character is named Bontecou, uh, Harry, Harry Bontecou. Yeah. And I wonder whether you remembered when you gave him that name that one of the really important studies of the McCarthy period, Elena. Eleanor Bontecou, yeah. on the loyalty security yeah. program, and she said in that book that the real problem for historians is going to be to find out what happened to all of those employees who were thrown out of work in that period. So I thought since you called him Bontecou, I might read this novel and find out what happened to all of these employees. And that wasn't your focus in this no, book, it's not my which no, is yeah. fair enough. Sure. But did you, uh, you, you yeah. have that in mind when you named him? And you know, the, the lieutenant governor of New York when I was at school was Montague. Ah, okay. I can't remember his name, but, but his, his son was at school with me. Right. But people are treating it as kind of an odd name. But it is a coincidence that Eleanor Bonnecke wrote on that right. subject. The question I want to ask you is this. Uh, <clears throat> I was very much influenced by a professor <clears throat> who figures in this book who said that the, the way the American people assert uh, a, a, a basic consensus is mostly by, by non-legislative, non-theoretical means. For instance, if it is decided, as it was decided after the Second World War, that uh, what simply passed easily as social anti-Semitism was um, a, a poisonous temptation. What happened was that uh, people who expressed their anti-Semitism began to feel that it was an obnoxious thing to do. <coughs> uh, 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 McGeorge Bundy told me that uh, he would leave a dining room in which he heard said such commentary as was routinely said by his father. Now, <clears throat> I use that as an example to ask the question, when McCarthy sought to, uh, to push the anti-communist position, he was saying, let's not be pleasant to people who are towing, hoeing the, 
the Communist Party line. Just, just not be pleasant to them. Don't, don't let them work in, in the federal government. Uh, um, there are various forms of, pers of, of pers persecution then suggested. There was the Smith Act, the Communist Control Act. Uh, there was I said, the failure to invite them to your parties or to hire them uh, for your school. Now, I, I, I think that unless you are totally wedded to the idea of the, of the open society as, as, as your model, this is the way societies work. And I think in this, a study of McCarthy's uh, period is useful in probing that. Well, I, I don't think uh, there's anything wrong with Wilmore Sherrill's theory, the professor in your book, or Wilmore Kendall's yeah. theory, a professor in real life. But it's a question of how you apply it. If you apply it to take away constitutional <coughs> rights, to take away First Amendment rights, to take away uh, rights to uh, representation by counsel, to take away rights to travel, which, which are to take away rights to privacy, then I think there's something deeply wrong with it. And I think that's what happened during the McCarthy years. Well, the, the Communist Control Act, which was, by the way, <coughs> endorsed by the majority of the ADA. Oh, yes, only one uh, senator that's right. voted for it. It said the Communist yes. Party is not a party. Don't go around saying it's just like the Republican Party, just like the Democrat or the Social. It's not. It's the agency of a foreign power. <coughs> now, if, if that is correct, oughtn't there to be some organized uh, resistance to its imposture? I mean, I, and I, what forms does it take? I mean, I think it, it's incorrect. The Communist Party was a party. It also was, at the leadership level, responsive to taking its line from Moscow. But at the membership level, which was 99% of the people who passed through it, mm -hmm. there were people in Harlem who were fighting rent strikes and making common cause with uh, the local uh, merchants, regardless of what was said in Moscow, and uh, it's very important well, to think, make I, that I, distinction. I, 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 I think, think I, I think that's a distinction that doesn't really hold up because I, uh, I grew up in, in a, a, a milieu where there were I knew many in many families, the members of people, children, and and uh, parents were members of the Communist Party. Everybody understood that. They w their first loyalty was the Soviet fatherland. I mean, it was just, uh, it didn't even have to be spelled out. It was understood that, uh, that what served Soviet interests came first. Every, mem every member of the Communist Party USA knew that. It didn't have to, it didn't have to be reiterated because that as was the foundation. The that the was the foundation Hilton, stone. Hilton, first of all. <coughs> so you can't, you can't discuss it as well, a, as, well as, a, as a political party. You can because it was the motherland, I think. But you can because uh, that's why, in, in my view anyway, there were a million members of the party in that period, but, but a maximum of 75,000 at any one time. As people got disillusioned, as the party didn't reflect their understanding of what it ought to be doing, they came and they left. They quit. That's why it had such a great turnover. But the people who were there at the time fighting against lynching and the poll tax in the South, fighting <coughs> uh, on behalf of poor people in the North, fighting uh, against the civil war, uh, fighting, against fighting on fascism of in Hitler Spain, the Nazi pact. against the, ag well, a lot of people quit during the Nazi pact, yeah. and but a, a lot, lot of people didn't. were fighting a against it. A lot didn't. Some didn't. I mean, I knew, I knew, I knew, I knew well-educated yeah. people well, of course, some did. Uh, holding important jobs right. in publishing who didn't leave the That's party right. until the Hungarian uprising in 1956. Right. And That's a lot right. not then. That's Howard Fast told me that what caused the, the greatest exodus was the 20th. Congress speech. Oh, yeah, Khrushchev speech. But, in, said, but yeah, in 1956, Stalin, Stalin was actually. Yeah. Uh, but in that year, the party had 15,000 members, and uh, an agent named Jack Levine, a former FBI agent, wrote an article in The Nation pointing out that 7,500 of them were FBI agents. <laughs> well, <laughs> I, you, you, you've used that. Yeah. It's very well, it's amusing, true. but of course, it's, pre you know, it's preposterous that, <coughs> that every <laughs> other member was a member of the FBI. Well, However, in. Uh, <coughs> In, in, uh, Good vaudeville, but uh, the, the former McCarthy, agent who I think, wrote it, I, I, think, you know, I, didn't I, I think Ms. Kramer is, is correct that in the McCarthy episode <coughs> can't be understood well without paying more attention to the context in which he, in which he uh, labored, and also paying some attention to the excesses of his enemies. When you have Bertrand Russell saying, uh, in America, such is the fear that we feel for McCarthy, it's unsafe to read Thomas Jefferson. <laughs> well, now, can you point to anything McCarthy said that begins to reach the enormity of that s statement? 
But people are saying that kind of routinely. And well, look, and, wow. and, 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 the, and the memoirs of Max Frankel just published, the uh, former executive editor of the New York Times, one of the great stars of the New York Times. In talking about uh, the period of his uh, tenure as the head of the Moscow Bureau of the New York Times uh, in the Soviet Union, uh, he says, well, Americans uh, uh, can't be smug about the way uh, the, the Russians uh, succumbed to the, the Soviet authority, because look at the way the Americans behaved during the McCarthy period. And so here is Max Frankel in 1999 yeah. still trying to establish some kind of moral equivalence yeah. well, between the, Amer but, between the behavior Tenen of the United the States thing, yeah. uh, in the McCarthy period and the, and the Soviet Union under Stalin. Now, that's intolerable, yeah. but as well as unintelligent. Okay. Uh, well, I would say two things. Number one, speaking of the New York Times, he should know because the New York Times had as a policy during that period, you could not refuse to cooperate with a duly organized committee of the Congress and keep your job if it involved dealing with editorial content. Uh, even if, if you took the Fifth Amendment, you were out. If you took the First Amendment, you were bumped out of the line of content. So one of the things that happened during th that period was that someone like Alden Whitman was taken off of his job where he was at the, uh, the top. communist. The top of a period. He had been a yeah. communist. Was taken off his job and put on the index. So if you look at the pages during those th years, you find the front page will say Ring, Ring Lardner named as communist and the index will say Bud Schulberg thinks on roommate because they roomed together at Dartmouth College. <laughs> Thank so you, you, Victor Vasky of Nation Magazine. Thank you, Hilton Kramer of the New Criterion, ladies and gentlemen. Stibo Production, in association with South Carolina ETV. Funding for Firing Line was made possible by a major grant from the John M. Olin Foundation, Incorporated, and the Friends of Firing Line. For information about a video cassette of this program, write to Firing Line, 2700 Cypress Street, Columbia, South Carolina, 29205, or call 803-799-3449. That's Firing Line, 2700 Cypress Street, Columbia, South Carolina, 29205 or call 803-799-3449.